how appreciation may grow. Let us return once more to Mrs. Brown and Miss Languish. Mrs. Brown, a good citizen and a religious woman, we may believe, was struck with a picture because of the moral it pointed, the religion it upheld. Miss Languish, on the other hand, repudiated any connection between art and religion or morals. We have said that the function of art is to bring us back to life, to the underlying significance in human experience. Now, while the meaning in all our lives is undeniably connected with our ideals, with our beliefs, in short, with our values, these represent feelings which form into religion and moral codes on the one hand and into works of art on the other. The effect on us of art, which is inspired by the loftiest ideals, the most fervent belief, has nothing to do with religious and moral teaching, even though the painter may have been a monk, the poet a moralist. What is required to appreciate a work of art fully is a share of the spiritual feeling that went into it, a share of the sentiment and belief. For while faith and fine qualities of the heart are constant, the forms of faith and behavior vary from age to age, from civilization to civilization. Didactic art, or art which sets out to teach, and polemic art, which submits itself to the service of an idea or contemporary policy, die with the dogma or faction they support. The test of great art is that it outlives what is transitory. The religious paintings of El Greco are beautiful in a large measure because of their creator's faith, but not because of the articles of that faith. In the same way, the monstrous graven deities, half beast, half human, which gaze at each other majestically across the Egyptian corridors of the British Museum, were hewn out of the religious awe of the dawn of Mediterranean civilization. They were born of Egyptian mythology. Few understand, and no one believes in that mythology now. Yet, the colossal figures still evoke awe in us. They express a calm and sublime grandeur, conceptions of vastness and mystery to which we still respond despite all the researches of our science, all the refinements of our belief. The connection between religion, morals and art, in brief, lies at the root where all have their common origin in the human spirit and in the human heart. But the flowering is separate, religion and morality from the one stem, art from the other. Knowledge that leads to taste in art. You should not say it is not good. You should say you do not like it. And then, you know, you're perfectly safe. This witticism of Whistler's, the American painter, might well have been repeated by Miss Languish to Mrs. Brown. For while Mrs. Brown had spiritual and emotional experience, she could not have hoped to express a valuable opinion on any work of art until she had some knowledge of aesthetic principles or, more plainly, of the nature of art. Until she had this, she could not even begin to form a taste of her own. She had opinions and an idea of what a picture ought to look like. What taste she had was formed by the pretty, pretty sentimental portraits of a Van Dixie or a Gruz. Formation of individual taste in art is not nearly so common as it would seem from listening to the number of people who dogmatize about their likes and dislikes. A lady, herself a talented miniature painter, once pointed to a picture in the National Gallery with the observation that she had particular affection for it because it was the only picture she had ever come to appreciate purely by herself without anyone else's opinion to influence her. Hers was not so meager an achievement as it sounded. Taste, as distinct from opinion, is rare. To acquire it, it is not enough to be familiar with the principles of art, with art history. Nor does it even suffice to have walked through a great number of galleries all over the world. Sincerity, the essence of appreciation, Taste should evolve in us with our own individuality. It should start with real, sincere appreciation of something. 
even if it is not something wholly good. The important thing is that we should respond to what is sincere, what is beautiful in the poem or picture on our own. The son of John Evelyn, the diarist, quoted the classics when he was five, but he would have shown more taste, the promise of a finer appreciation, had he thrown Virgil and Horace on the fire and gone of his own free will to a poem by Herrick. If he had surprised his too cultured father by coming out with, here a little child I stand, heaving up my either hand, cold as paddocks though they be, yet I lift them up to thee. Taste does not depend on a wide range of aesthetic experiences. One's taste may be excellent in a narrow compass, but it will be found that when one has really begun to appreciate anything for oneself, let us say Gothic architecture, then this will lead naturally by an evolution of taste to appreciation of other styles. Because art, though it is often exhibited in such sepulchral places as on most museums, and though books coldly lay it forth in examples and periods, art is not a number of objects arranged chronologically and exhibited in showcases. Art is alive, contemporaneous, continuous. Once you have really identified yourself with a masterpiece, experienced the full pleasure, responded to the vital contact with reality which it expresses, you will not stop there, for you will already in that one example have appreciated motifs, which, while they are auxiliary to the main conception in that particular work, have been the dominant motif in masterpieces of later or earlier times. The discovery that art is a human activity. Appreciation of kinds of art proceeds concurrently with the broadening of one's intellectual interests and the deepening of one's emotional experiences. Considering only European art, leaving aside Eastern and primitive art, two tendencies are perceptible which come to the fore alternately and which indicate the spirit of the age. For the artist's intuition precedes the critic's formula in much the same way as the wooden mannequin and his wife swing to and fro from the doors of their chimney piece cottage, foretelling wet or dry weather. There is a kind of art which seems to be produced in a civilization which has reached maturity, a civilization which is neither struggling to establish itself nor is being racked by wars, yet which has not reached a complacent condition where the vital flames, the belief in itself, the vigor and achievement have burnt low. The best period of Greek art is an example. There is about such art a repose, a clearness, a calm intellectual ordering, as if the soul had made a perfect balance between the passions and the reason, and the artist a just compromise between the individual and society. There is a tendency in this art as it passes its meridian for harmony of line, formal beauty, to predominate more and more over color, tradition over innovation, generally accepted, intellectually formulated truths over bright flashes of intuition. Precepts begin to crystallize and in literature, for example, we find rules for the drama formulated by Aristotle and for poetry by Horace. Because of the great periods of this kind of art in Greece and Rome, it is generally referred to as classical art. But it is not confined to those civilizations. Both the 17th century in France and the 18th century in England were classical in spirit. Classical art, be it a poem by Pope, a drama by Racine, a Queen Anne building, is not as a rule the first kind of art one appreciates. When we first adventure into the realms of art, we are attracted by works which have more élan, less of the intellect and more of the fancy. The Elizabethan dramatists and Ibsen are more to our taste than Euripides and Corneille. The aspiring Gothic arch traces the spirit of adolescence more closely than the tranquil architrave of the Greeks, and Wagner has at this period more to impart to our imagination than has Bach. 
Romantic art is individual. It is revolutionary, glamorous, ardent, colorful. It attracts the eye sooner than the more restrained art of the classicists. Yet, there comes a time as our appreciation widens when we find that rigorous distinctions between kinds are misleading and that they do not serve to describe much of the best art. When we have come in painting to appreciate equally a Botticelli, a Rubens, a Hogarth and a Leonardo, we cease to have much more use for such a rough distinction as that between classical and romantic art. And when this happens, we have attained a knowledge of the nature of art. We have formed a Catholic taste of our own.